It's so important we also take care of ourselves and we don't work ourselves to the bone. Again, I'm a, I'm a workaholic. Um, they asked me in the hospital, what are your hobbies? And I'm like, forensics. My work is my hobby. <laughs> when I'm not working, I'm doing research. I'm reading something. I'm my, my, this is my only hobby, I think, you know, and I was, I was working, I was working, I was working and, and that's what I did. And, um, I didn't go to the doctors. Uh, when I was in there, I remember the doctor even asking me, you know, last time you were the doctor, what was your blood pressure at? What was your blood sugar at? What was your, and I was like, sir, I haven't been to the doctor in 18 years. Hey there, my name's Ashley Church. And I'm Erin West. We were once newly promoted crime scene and latent print supervisors on mutual struggle buses as we both simultaneously tried to navigate through the challenges within our forensic units. Now we run a business where we create tools and resources that we wish we had had to make these transitions easier. We like to talk about the experiences we've had in the forensic field, the good, the bad, and the ugly, in the hopes to create awareness around these issues and move the needle forward to create positive change in the forensic community. So if you're a forensic professional, regardless of your years of experience, who's not afraid to dive into real, raw, and sometimes uncomfortable topics, you're in the right place. This is the Forensics Unfiltered Podcast. Hey there, welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. This is Ashley, one of your co-hosts from Forensics Unfiltered. And as you know, especially if you live in the United States, this week is Thanksgiving. So in the forensic world, that usually means things are about to ramp up and we're definitely glad you're here to join us for part two of our conversation with Jason Cole. If you tuned in last week, you heard his incredible journey through his forensic career. He has over 20 years in law enforcement and went on to start working at Foster and Freeman. Today, he's opening up about the two events that completely changed his outlook on life, leadership, and the importance of taking care of our mental and our physical health. We know it's a heavy topic, but it's an important one, especially as we head into Thanksgiving and the holiday season. This time of year can be tough, even for the toughest of all of us. And Jason's story is a powerful reminder to check in with yourself and with your coworkers and colleagues. All right, let's get into part two with Jason Cole. This is an episode that might just change the way you look at your own health and well-being. Before we start this episode, our guests would like to share a disclaimer that the opinions shared are their own and not representative of their current or past employment. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. I think um, Ashley and I and we know that you have as well, but not only did we learn over time that it was okay to not be okay with certain scenes and seeing things and, and all of that, but we both had experiences as well, like throughout the course of our career that really changed our perspectives on what was most important. And it wasn't until those kinds of things happened where, you know, our perspective really shifted. So for just myself, for example, I was very much uh, like, I'm available anytime you need me. Like, I will be here. I will come in early. I will work late. I will work weekends. I will work holidays. I will always answer my phone, always answer my emails, no matter what time of day it is. Uh, and then something happened in my life that I was like, Hurt! and all of that changed. And so like now at work, I still dedicate a lot to my job. However, when the day's over, I'm going to go home. Uh, if you send me an email on a Saturday, I'm going to check it on Monday. And a lot of time in our classes, we talk about that to supervisors and leaders. Like it's okay to check out for a little bit and it's okay yeah. to be like, this is family time and I'm not going to check my work emails and I'm, I'm not going to answer that call. And we'll have a lot of supervisors be like, but oh my gosh, you have to, you know? And so both of us had life experiences where it forced us to reevaluate like the balance and not everybody goes through that but i feel like you recently went through something like that has that kind of 
if you want to share a little bit about that. Has that kind of altered, quickly altered your perspective on things like like it did for us? Are you still in your adjustment oh, uh, period? A hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred percent it did. So I actually have a couple of experiences and, and uh, yeah. I'll, I'll share a couple. Early on in my career, when I was working at West Valley City, my boss at the time, the director of, of the crime lab, uh, was a gentleman by the name of Scott Spew. Scott was a, an amazing individual. We called him a gentle giant. Uh, he joked around that he was five foot twenty one, and uh, he was, uh, you know, six foot nine, and and just a a presence uh, whenever he walked into a room. And not just due to his stature and his size, uh, but also due to his knowledge. Who to love fingerprints by working at West Valley City with Scott. He's actually one of the reasons I, I left becoming a police officer to go work at West Valley City was because I'd met Scott several times. And I'm like, I'd love to work with that guy. He's awesome. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never forget. It was uh, January 2nd of 2003. And uh, I was there at work that day with Scott uh, and one of my other coworkers, James May. Uh, and James had gone home for the day. He wasn't feeling well. And so it was just Scott and I. Uh, and, and we were in the back room. Um, he was photographing some uh, items that he had developed fingerprints on. Uh, I was doing some digital downloads in that same room. And we were talking about, it was, it was a Thursday. It was our, our, the start of our weekend. Um, his son had gotten a snowboard for Christmas. And we were talking about that and going snowboarding. And my family's a big snowboarder. I'm a skier and, you know, all of that. And we were just, yeah, just having a, a great conversation. And I got up, I'd finished my downloads and I got up and I walked into the room next door, still part of the lab to, to get some evidence uh, and put it away that I had super glued and dye stained. And I was gonna look at that then on the following Monday. And it, you know, I dye stained it. So it was just kind of drying in there. And so I was putting it, putting it away, putting it, uh, locking it up for the weekend and stuff. Uh, when I heard a gun go off. Now, again, I'm a former police officer. I, I know what a gun sounds like. But I remember running into that room and in in that room where we, where we took photographs of the prints, there was one of those overhead lights that had the, uh, just kind of a square box with the tubes in them, the, the fluorescent tubes. And I remember flipping the switch and the lights didn't come on. And I just remember saying, Scott, what was that? Are you okay? And he was standing there with his back to me. And I just remember him turning and looking towards me saying, Jason, I think I've been shot. Mm -hmm. And as he turned, I begin to see on his white lab coat, the blood starting to come out of the chest area. And I ran in and I grabbed him and I helped him to the ground um, and started to apply uh, pressure to the wound and talking to him and trying to keep him awake. Um, you know, Scott stay with me. And at the same time too, the training kicking in going, we need to get help here now immediately. And so I ran uh, to my desk and grabbed my radio. And I just remember radioing that into, into dispatch. And I remember my time as a police officer in Utah, we used a lot of plain speech. You know, we had the 10 code out here, but we used a lot of plain speech on the radio. And I remember listening as I was getting hired on at Sandy and listening to the radio and stuff like that, I remember sometimes, you know, when something, somebody was in a chase or something, how people's voices would just kind of escalate, you know, go up and they'd talk really, really fast when, when something serious happened. And, and I always thought, oh, and that's never going to happen to me. You know, I'm going to always keep my cool. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something to the gist of, to dispatch, I need an ambulance to the forensics unit immediately. There's been a shooting. And I grabbed my radio and I ran back into the room where Scott was at and I continued to apply pressure to his wound, continued to try to keep him awake and talk to him. And I was so focused on him, I didn't hear a lot of the other radio traffic coming in. But when I radioed it into dispatch, obviously my voice, what I thought was normal speech, I obviously was very excited. And my voice clearly was, was changed by that. And, and they thought that possibly a gunman had come into the forensics lab 
And so they thought it might be like a hostage situation. And so as officers are kind of coming into the building, they're taking more of a tactical stance, kind of clearing the building, making sure they don't miss anything. And I remember just sitting there thinking, where the hell are they? Why are they not here yet? Get here. I need you guys now. And them calling out to me on the radio, are you okay? You know, Alpha 24, Alpha 24, are you okay? Are you okay? And I was so focused on Scott, I, I didn't hear all of that. And finally, when that first officer came in, I just remember screaming, get here now. I need you. Help me, help me, help me. And they rushed in when they realized there wasn't a threat uh, and kind of took over. And I remember one of the officers kind of came and put his arm around me and walked me out uh, and, and talked with me. Scott passed away later that night. And uh, probably one of the hardest things I've, I've gone through in my career. Not a lot of people know that story. They know the story about Scott, but they don't know that I was the one that was there with him when it happened. Difficult time. And I remember we were off for a little bit because they had to clean up the lab and everything like that. And I remember coming back to work and I had some cases that were opened and several of the cases that I had had firearms associated with them. And I remember just coming in looking at those cases going, I can't, I, I just can't process a gun case right now. Give me a drug case, give me a property, give me anything. But if it's got a firearm, I, I can't handle it right now. And every time I saw one of those cases, I could picture in my mind, Scott turning towards me saying, I think I've been shot. And uh, it was tough. And again, it was one of those things we didn't talk a lot about mental health at the time. And I could not talk to my coworkers about it because I didn't want to be viewed as somebody who couldn't handle the job, right? I'm a, I'm a former cop. I'm a tough guy. I'm a bigger guy myself, right? I, I can handle anything. I was struggling, but it was hard to talk to anybody about because I couldn't appear weak. I finally had a, a coworker who recognized it, uh, actually a couple of coworkers and, and they came in, I came into work one day and all the cases that had guns with them that were on my desk were gone. Uh, and I remember talking to my one coworker going, somebody's been in here in the lab. My, I've got cases missing. He goes, you're fine. I do. These were, I had these cases sitting on this corner of my desk and they're gone. I swear. And he goes, they're fine. Don't worry about it. They're not missing. You're fine. Don't worry. You know? And finally he kind of took me aside and he's like, if you need to talk, I'm here. Don't worry about those cases. They're taken care of. And it's then I kind of realized that they recognized that something was not okay with me and kind of came in and cleared those off. And, and it took some while, it took a little while before I could handle some of those cases again. But I remember just, you know, the, the compassion shown to me by my coworkers, I realized, and maybe it was just how I viewed things on the inside, but I realized, no, it's, it's okay not to be okay. And it's okay to struggle and it's okay to have a hard time. And it's important to talk about fast yeah. forward now, a couple of years, I think the incident that you're talking about, I was in Texas uh, for my company teaching uh, some classes down there for, uh, for the great people in Texas. And uh, while there uh, I ended up in the hospital, uh, I ended up having a stroke while I was down there. And, uh, Due to that, I was in the hospital for a week, and then I was at an inpatient rehabilitation center where I was for a month, not allowed to leave, trying to get a bunch of things uh, with me back into control, my blood sugar, my high blood pressure, uh, learning how to do a lot of things again. Uh, I'm, as you know, I'm pretty animated. I like to move when I talk. Some of you may be laughing a little bit. No, it's not the camera having jitters and things like that. Uh, I've had a stroke and literally the right side of my body uh, is still numb. In fact, just yesterday I hit the, the three month anniversary of my, of my stroke. And like I said, I still, still am numb, uh, still slowly recovering. It's a long recovery I've learned. But because I was then in the hospital, I, I missed the IAI conference in Reno this year. Uh, and I've been to every IAI conference for the last 10 years. This was the first one I've missed. And I was devastated. I was heartbroken. Now, my company's awesome. They printed out that big cardboard thing we were talking about. Uh, the life-size cutout of Jason. And they had it at the booth because they knew people would, would be missing me and wanting to see me. 
You are um, definitely there in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And some of my friends printing out pictures of my face and putting them on popsicle sticks so that I could be there at the conference with them at their social events and doing things like that. But I really learned from that incident that I used to call us a, a pretty tight knit forensic community. And uh, I've changed that now and I call us a forensic family. Uh, because the, that have reached out to me, that sent me text messages or emails or Facebook messages or uh, whatever it might be, sending me good luck, uh, sending me well wishes, sending me positive vibes, sending thoughts and prayers my way, whatever you want to call it, whatever you kind of believe in, but just all those people within our community that were sending me those saying, Jason, if you need anything, I'm here for you. I'm sending you good thoughts. Uh, my thoughts and prayers are with you. Uh, positive vibes coming your way was was overwhelming. And it, it has helped me work hard to become better. If you know anything about strokes, it is a long, long recovery. Every stroke is different. You know, the doctors tell me with the numbness on my body, they're like, Rel you're relatively young. You're in fairly good shape. You should get back to normal or about 98, 99% of where you were before you had the stroke, normal-wise. A lot of people are probably laughing, going, Jason, normal? Hmm, I don't know about that. <laughs> no. You know what I mean. But then they also say, the place you are right now, that may be as good as it gets for you. You may not get any better than that. You may live with that tingly and numbness in your body the rest of your life. You know, you may struggle to walk the rest of your life. You may struggle to kind of grab things and do things with your right arm. Uh, the rest of your life. I, I hope not. Uh, and I am working my tail off in, in physical therapy and occupational therapy. And what keeps me going is the continued messages from people in the forensic community. And um, it's yeah. been a struggle. And I recognize and I know I'm not the only one that's that's struggling. Um, I think I'm that's the important with... part to remember, too, because I think as we shared our experiences and our traumas and stuff too, I think a lot of other people started to chime in and be like, oh, I went through something similar and it was a really hard time. And I didn't have anyone to talk to about it because no one really was talking about it. And you realize like how important it actually is. And even though it is uncomfortable, we thank you first for sharing those because we understand how it's a scary thing. It's not a comfortable thing to be able to share those stories out loud, but especially in a public setting. So uh, we appreciate you definitely, you know, sharing that with people because I do think it's, it's someone out there needs to hear it. Someone out there needs to know they're not alone. And, you know, there's people like you that have gone through something similar that they can lean on. Like you said, the forensic community is more of like a forensic family and we, t we need to be the resource that people turn to, right? Because there's really nothing yeah. else out there at the moment that's as effective as being able to talk to someone that can relate to the same experiences. Yeah. And I, and I think a big part, just adding on to that real quick, it's so important we also take care of ourselves and we don't work ourselves to the bone. Again, I'm a, I'm a workaholic. Um, they asked me in the hospital, what are your hobbies? And I'm like, forensics. My work is my hobby. <laughs> when I'm not working, I'm doing research. I'm reading something. I'm my, my, this is my only hobby, I think, you know, and I was, I was working, I was working, I was working and, and that's what I did. And, um, I didn't go to the doctors. Uh, when I was in there, I remember the doctor even asking me, you know, last time you were the doctor, what was your blood pressure out? What was your blood sugar out? What was your, and I was like, Sir, I haven't been to the doctor in 18 years. I'm I'm a guy. <laughs> You're I'm really pushing least, it. I mean, shoot, look at me. You know, as I'm laying in a hospital bed, I'm like, come on, look at me. You know, I'm I'm healthy. I'm fine. There's not a bone sticking out. You know, just give me a shot. Do whatever you got to do. I'll be good. I'm out the door as soon as this is done. Not really recognizing how severe my stroke was, uh, and and how truthfully lucky I was to be alive uh, at, at this point. In law enforcement, we don't make a lot of money. We're not going to have that mansion up on the hill. We're not going to have all the toys. But the one, the one thing that we do have is pretty decent benefits. Take advantage of that. Go and see your doctor. Guys, don't be dumb like me. 
uh, women. You two, typically women are a little bit smarter than men when it comes to going to the doctors, but still <laughs> uh, there's, there's some who don't. And, and it's so critical. If you can learn from me, do it. I, I don't know. I, was, I got to go to the Florida II this last week and it was awesome catching up to people. And that's the one thing I tell people is if I had been going to the doctor, can I say with 100% certainty that I, I wouldn't have had a stroke? No, I can't. But there's a good chance that I probably wouldn't have and I wouldn't be dealing with these issues. And I, I you know, I wouldn't be laying in bed at night in, in, in just, I, I don't want to say it, it's not really pain. It's just such a weird sensation having these pins and needles and this tingling that it's difficult to sleep. And, you know, and sometimes your brain messes with you and is like, yeah, this could be the best you get. And I'm like, I don't want to live the next 35 years of my life, not being able to do a lot of the things that I used to be able to do. Uh, and that's, and that's tough. You know, your, your brain can mess with you that way, but yeah, my advice is just go, go take care of it physically, but also mentally it's okay. If you need to also go talk to a therapist and say, I, I just need somebody to talk to. That's cool. That's okay. And like you said, there's, there's people reaching out and there's, there's people there that are willing to talk that have kind of been through it too. And it's, and it's okay. I think there's I a book out there. Get... I haven't personally read it, but a lot of people recommend it is the body keeps the score. And I think it kind of has similar lessons like you mentioned, where if you don't deal with your health, whether that be physical or mental health, your body's going to have a way to force you to deal with it. So that could <laughs> look like a stroke, I've seen it with my father. It looks like a heart, heart attacks that slowed him down, you know, it's forcing him to stop. Yep. I've seen brain aneurysms. I've seen diabetes, stuff like that. Um, and then on the mental health side of things, if you don't deal with that trauma, right, can show up as anxiety and depression, all sorts of things that <laughs> is harder. Like the more you neglect it, the longer the healing is going to take. So if you have good practices, going to the doctor, talking about stuff regularly from the beginning of your career, then you could prevent something like that from happening, or it would take a lot less time for you to recover from something like that. Yes. So I do want to say one of the things that we have decided to start doing with these podcast episodes is to invite our vault members to watch these live. So if you're listening to this podcast after the fact, you can come to these live and listen and watch the recording and also ask questions directly to the guest speakers. So welcome to our vault members that are actually here live and attending. If you guys have not yet heard of the vault, it is a gap science membership, which allows you access to tons of different webinar replays, e-courses, academies, and all of our past conferences that you can watch at your own pace in your own time at any time you have unlimited access to it as long as you are a member and then you also get access to special events like attending live podcasts and we have a monthly meet and greet for all of our vault members as well so if you guys have any questions for jason if you want to go ahead and drop them in the chat we will ask those to him in just a moment here so before we get to the live q a is there any other last minute thoughts that you would like to share based off of you know your career and your experiences with scott and your most recent uh, health journey yeah i think it's it's one that uh, you'll be hearing from me a lot more about this uh i'm i'm going to be an open book uh when it comes to uh, my history the things i've gone through the things i've experienced I love teaching at conferences, and this is going to be a topic that I definitely talk about a lot more. I've been talking to a friend of mine. Uh, we are talking about combining, uh, kind of going in together to teach a class at the IAI next year in Florida. So please be on the lookout for that one. It's going to be fun. And uh, he and I both have a, have a pretty cool story to share. I don't know, I'd say cool story because it's really not a cool story, but it's an, I think it's an important story to share. Um, and mine is definitely going to deal a lot with my stroke and, and just talking about mental health and mental well-being and, and taking care of yourself. Uh, you've kind of got one life. While we love our jobs and, and jobs are important, they, they put food on the table and, and pay the bills and things like that. 
uh, it's it's not everything. Uh, there's there's more to life than just our our job and, and uh, our jobs and and the work that we do. So that's such an important message. So we're looking forward to seeing you and your presentation at the FDII next year. And Aaron, is there any questions from the floor from our vault members? So I'm not currently seeing any questions. We'll give them a minute to type something into the chat if they would like to. Um, we are excited about next year's IAI because that's going to be a combined because it's in Orlando, right? Right. Yes. F FDII and IAI will be combined. And I will say before we log off and complete this episode, you talked a lot about your career in law enforcement, but didn't really mention any of your professional associations, which you are all kinds of members and <laughs> on boards and all of those kinds of things. So I think it would be worth noting for people. He's kind of um, a big deal. He's kind of a big deal, yeah. So I think it'd be <laughs> worth right? noting for some of our listeners, like maybe some of the things that you're part of and how they could become a part if they wanted to kind of do a little more outside of their their job, you know, being engaged in the forensic community. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah, when I was in Utah, I got affiliated with the Utah IAI, the Utah Division, and got on their board. I actually was on their board of directors for 10 years, including a year as president with them. Uh, and then when I went down to Nevada, Nevada was a struggling division at the time. And in fact, the last time the IAI conference, conference was in Reno, so was that six years ago, seven years ago now? Uh, Nevada actually turned in their charter. So Nevada is actually now part of California. But when I went down there, Nevada was a struggling division and I'd been working with them because we had been doing the tri-division conference, which was Utah, Nevada, and Arizona, where we kind of joined forces and we do a yearly conference. And so when I went down there, they pretty much said, you're our new president, Jason. And so for seven years, I was the president of that organization, tried to run it. When I started with Foster and Freeman, I got affiliated uh well i was already a member of the iai the parent body iai but i uh ran and was voted uh and put onto the board of directors for the parent body iai and uh, i've now been uh on their board for seven years uh, now working on my eighth year for those of you that were at the conference in reno uh first of all hopefully you went to the membership meeting on friday but thank you for those of you that voted for me i was actually uh, voted back on uh, which was interesting because I wasn't at the conference. And again, I kind of talk about our, our forensic family, but just having people reach out to me that that I considered friends, but I never knew would literally just go before the nomination committee and go before the Florida caucus and the, the Texas caucus and 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 then go before the membership uh, the membership meeting on my behalf and uh, speak for me and and push to get me or to, to retain me uh, on the board of directors. Um, very humbling, very touching. So I'm happy I get another two years to serve uh, on the board of directors uh, for them. So for those of you that are not members of the IAI, I strongly encourage you uh, to become a member of the IAI and also to become members of your local divisions. So the Florida division, if you're in Florida or the California division, if you're in California, wherever you are at, there is a division here in the United States that you can become a part of. And it's it's important to not just to become a member of, but to get involved with. Um, serve on committees, go and offer to help out. Conferences are amazing, but they're also a lot of work. Offer to help. And not just even the IAI, there's also a lot of other organizations and, and things like that. Gap Sands is a, is a <laughs> great example of that. You know, you mentioned the, the fantastic summit that you guys just put together a couple of weeks ago, amazing training opportunity <laughs> for people. Um, Why, thank you. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't your first and everybody has something to give. So, you know, reach out to you guys. Uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to maybe teach a class or discuss with them, they'll, they'll discuss with you if you think, oh, maybe I've been thinking about talking about this. Do you guys think there's a, an audience for it? Do you think it's important? I mean, shoot, you guys can help them too. And it's just... It's important. One of the things I share with people is, you know, there's a the phrase out there that knowledge is power. 
and I'm going to say that that's a bunch of BS. Uh, what it is is shared knowledge is power. Uh, the true power comes when we share that knowledge. If we keep all that knowledge to ourselves, it does absolutely no good. That Love truly that. becomes powerful when we share it with others. And so people need to, you know, they may think, oh, I haven't been doing this very long. You still got something to share. So, Love yeah, that. get That's involved. So <laughs> I definitely agree. I think that becoming part of the organizations and going to the conference and stuff, it really broadens your view of forensics outside of your own department. So thank you. Yeah. So we have a few things from our vault members here. So first a comment about them really appreciating your vulnerability, says the family aspect of the community in the field now and awareness in the community has definitely helped them, especially in the last few years. And then we do have a question for you as well. So yeah. how do you balance keeping family life, but also wanting to pursue justice for the victims' families? Uh, this person sometimes feels that the family of others kind of sneaks in as a priority above their own family, and they're having a hard time with that balance. Sure. So, uh, you know, and, and it's a unique job that we're in, right? I mean... <laughs> A lot of jobs are your standard eight to five, Monday through Friday. You know, we get weekends, holidays off. Uh, not not so with us. You know, there's some people who, yeah, you you may work kind of Monday through Friday or Monday through Thursday banker hours. But when that call comes in, you're forced to go out, not forced. We shouldn't be forced to do our job, but kind of, we're required kind of. to, to go up there and do our to do our job, right? And and that can be difficult. And sometimes on those cases, they they do require a lot of work. But the one thing I will say, and I, I mentioned this, you know, that we have decent benefits when we work for the government. And part of those benefits are a PTO uh, and and your time off. Take it, take it, and you know, kind of like we've we've discussed shut that phone off it's okay if you're not required to have your phone off it's okay to to shut that phone off especially I mean, even... if you're on pto <laughs> especially Absolutely. yes yes if yes. you're on vacation yeah. you can shut the yeah. phone off <laughs> yeah uh, it's it's so true and and i'll be honest and and this advice is really for me because i i definitely need it i need to I am so much better at, you know, do as I say, not as I, not as I do type thing. Uh, but then when you're with your family, when you're with your significant other, your kids, whatever it might be, your friends, be present, be there. If you don't have to have your work phone on, leave it, listen to them, enjoy just being with them. It, work, work will always be there. If you choose to keep it there 24 seven, it will be there 24 seven, but you can choose to shut it off. And, and that is okay to say, that is okay to say to your department when you go in and say, I'm sorry, you, you're not paying me to do that. So no, I, I didn't have my phone on me. Uh, I, I took my PTO and I'm on PTO. So I, I didn't need to answer my phone. I'm sorry. You know? It's it's okay. Uh, and HR, I promise you, is going to back you in your corner. When we work for law enforcement, when we work for that paramilitary, they're going to try to get everything out of you to choose, that they can. It's just the way that it is. Uh, you know, and definitely in forensics, uh, you know, I share this in a couple of my classes, but we are kind of the redheaded stepchildren of law enforcement, you know, and, and we are overworked and, and underpaid. I share a story about even when I was at West Valley and I started there. Uh, to where I became lab director and how much the city had grown, how much the police department had grown, even the records division had grown, the evidence division had grown, every part of the whole city and police department had grown, except for the forensics division. We were still four investigators and a director. Mm -hmm. And there was more work coming in and more to do, and we were expected to do more with less. And so, yes, yeah, sometimes it's okay to say no. Sometimes it is okay just to step and walk away. And, and it's a hard, hard thing to do. It really is because people in this field are passionate and they do care. But, you know, the, the advice I've shared with some people is if you were to be gone, sure that, sure that the 
your friends would miss you. The department might mourn a little bit, but they would replace you in a heartbeat. Um, I mean, even if you're a big deal like me, I'm I'm replaceable. <laughs> Um, as much as I want to say, I'm not, you know, I, I really am. And that's not to minimize or, or to say that we're not good at what we do. We're not great at what we do. We're not passionate about what we do, but, but yeah, just when yeah. take your PTO time and when you're with, when you're with your family, with your loved ones, with your friends, be there with them. I love that. I had someone early in my career that had told me like, you don't get an award for having the most PTO. And some people like to wear it like as a badge of honor, like oh, I have so many hours in my PTO break. And what that's telling me is you need to take a vacation immediately. <laughs> and I yeah. think one thing that's also helpful because I know for me, I would always feel so guilty, like putting those hard boundaries in, especially like taking vacation around holiday time. So something that we've started to do, or we try to do our best is like have our vacations plans like a year in advance so that I can ask for that vacation without having that emotional response because I'm asking for it well in advance. There's some holidays that I'm working and there's some holidays that I'm not. And um, that way, I, some of that guilt is kind of <laughs> eliminated a little bit. We love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Jason. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me and for everybody listening. Be good. Keep working <laughs> hard at what you do. And please, please, please go take take care of yourself, both mentally and, and physically. Absolutely. We suck in that wholly. <laughs> yes. So, but thank you guys for joining us for another episode of Forensics Unfiltered. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and we'll see you guys at the next one. Bye. Bye. Thanks guys. Whew. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Jason's story is definitely one that's going to stick with me. I'm sure it's going to stick with you. It's just one of those that's raw, it's real, a conversation that we need to keep having in this forensic field because all of us go through trauma. His message is about prioritizing mental health, physical health, and it's especially important as we head into the holiday season. Remember, it's okay not to be okay, and it's okay to ask for help. And as we wrap up today's episode and before we all leave for our Thanksgiving plans, we do want to leave you on a high note, leave you with a little extra holiday cheer. And we invite you to join us for the Reindeer Games. It's 10 days, 10 team challenges, completely free. It's just our way to give back to the forensic community and have a little bit of fun during the holiday season. And if you're looking to snag some forensic goodies for yourself, for your team, our Better Than Black Friday sale is live right now. We've put together some incredible deals that we hope will bring a smile to your face no matter what you've got on your plate this season. Take care of yourselves, stay safe, and we will catch you in the next episode. Thank you so much for being here and listening to Forensics Unfiltered. If you liked this episode, would you do us a favor and leave a review letting us know specifically what you liked about this topic? It will only take a minute, but it will really help us plan future episodes so we can bring you more topics that you want to listen to. We'll be sure to provide any links from today's episode in our show notes on our website. Head to www.gapscience.com. Until next time, stay safe out there.